Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the third webinar in our series of food strategy for your city. My name is Florence Pardo from the Food Foundation. And as ever, a real pleasure to be welcoming so many of you from around the globe. Today, we're going to be continuing looking at what goes into a food policy and um, a food strategy um, with a focus on sustainable food systems. So thinking about not only environmental sustainability, but also economic sustainability and four fantastic speakers as usual. Um, before we get started with our speakers, though, I wanted to invite you all to um, introduce uh, yourselves in the chat box. Um, we've got a really exciting global group that come together for these webinars from uh, we've got a big represent representation from India thanks to our partnership uh, with Eat Right India and the Eat Smart Cities but we've also got South Africa, Canada, Indonesia, Ghana, Kenya, Trinidad and Tobago, Bangladesh, Russia, Senegal so a really uh, fantastic global audience so please do use the chat box to say hello tell us where you're from and perhaps what your uh, your role is within your city and hopefully we can all start getting to know one another a little bit which would be really exciting so uh, do carry on with that throughout the session and of course if you have any questions please put them in the chat box we will be um, having a Q&A once the speakers um, have presented um, housekeeping please do keep yourselves muted we are recording the session, so if you do not want to be on camera, then please keep your camera off. Um, and I believe that's all from me. So I'm going to hand over straight off to our very first speaker. It is a pleasure to introduce Alan Dangor. Professor Dangor is a professor of food and nutrition for global health and a director of the Center on Climate Change and Planetary Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Alan's research there focuses on the connections between environment, food systems and health, and he undertakes a large amount of interdisciplinary research with an international focus covering issues including soil and agricultural science, environmental assessment, climate science, nutrition and health. Over to you, Alan. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that lovely introduction, Florence, and I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, really exciting opportunity to talk about the importance of considering sustainability and resilience when talking about food strategies. Uh, I really couldn't make a stronger case for the need for us all to be thinking about this. At the moment in London uh, and in UK, it's unbelievably hot. We've had some of now some of the hottest days on record in the UK in the last week. Uh, and this is uh, <clears throat> sadly uh, a trend that is going to continue. And we've seen around the world uh, significant impacts of climate change on weather uh, uh, and, and conditions around the world uh, are only increasing. And this, of course, is likely to have unbelievable impact on our food system. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why we need to think about environmental change uh, when we when we talk about uh, food uh, uh, strategies. So I'm, I'd also just like to highlight that I'm, uh, I am direct the Centre on Climate Change and Planetary Health at the school and we have a very active Twitter uh, account. So do, if you want to know about the latest research in this space, uh, please do follow us on Twitter. Great. So um, I've just spotted a typo on the opening slide for which I apologize. It should of course say the Food Cities 2020, 2022 webinar series, apologies for that, uh, but let's crack on. So I just want to just remind us all uh, what we mean when we talk about the food system. So the food system goes all the way from the farm in the top right hand corner to the processing plant, to the warehouse, to the, uh, to the shop. Uh, to the kitchen, to your mouth, and then of course to the bin, and also contains all the policies, the, uh, the, the institutions and the finances that run that food system. So when we talk about the food system, we mean the, the whole thing, all the way from the farm to the bin and all the policies and institutions that surround it. And that food system is remarkable in that it delivers sufficient food for in excess of 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, so that is really a remarkable thing. Uh, but let's also remember that it doesn't do that very well at all times. And this is a recent graph from the Global Nutrition Report 2020, which shows that in some parts of the world, in, in, in fact, many parts of the world, uh, the food system delivers too much food or, or, or leads that is associated with overweight and obesity. 
Uh, and in other parts of the world, uh, of course, uh, it doesn't deliver sufficient food or the food isn't of sufficient quality. And that can lead to problems such as stunting, which is poor growth in childhood, or anemia, which is typically associated with insufficient iron in the diet. And you can see that these things often co-occur. So they occur in the same countries or in, in fact, in the same households often at the same time. So you could have overweight mothers who are also anemic for example. And you see in many parts of the world, there is this problem of that's called the double burden of malnutrition. You have both indicators of too much food or overweight and obesity at the same time as insufficient food, so stunting or anemia in this case. So uh, the, the food system, as I say, delivers food for in excess of 7 billion people on the planet. But, it, but there are problems with the quality and the quantity of food that's been delivered. And in fact, uh, 11 million deaths a year, that's roughly one in five deaths a year, is associated with poor dietary quality. Uh, and this is a food system which uh, is delivering all this food, but is now going to be unbelievably challenged even more. So these are the graphs showing the changes, the projected changes in temperature uh, on the planet up until 2100. Uh, the red line is the line of we do nothing, we just carry on as we are, we pretend climate change doesn't exist, and we carry on. And you can see that that will lead to, uh, uh, that's projected to lead to a rise in at least four degrees uh, uh, temperature, four degrees centigrade, uh, or the blue line uh, is the line which is we which we must follow, which is we will try everything we possibly can to reduce our carbon emissions and to reduce the impact of of what we do to the planet, and that will still lead to at least a one or possibly two degrees rise in temperature by twenty one hundred. So the food system needs to deliver. Uh, food, the right sorts of food in an equitable manner, uh, healthy and sustainable diets for a growing population of nine or 10 billion uh, people uh, uh, whilst uh, responding to climate change. And of course, we know that many of those people will be living in cities, uh, the focus of today's talk, today's session or this, this series of webinars, um, and, uh, and, and those cities will be ever more populated. And you can see on the right there, Two, two maps of the, of, of the world showing that it's, the average temperature might be four degrees, uh, but actually the impacts of the, the, the distribution of those temperature changes is, is, is varied across the world. Some parts of the world will be nine, 10 degrees hotter uh, than other part than, than they are, uh, than, than they were uh, in, uh, you know, 100 years earlier. So the, the, the impact of climate change will be heterogeneous and will have significant impacts on the ability of the food system to deliver healthy foods. And what we know as well is that the impacts of climate change are likely to be significant on the yields of crops. So that's the amount of crops and the types of crops that are available. So for cereals, for vegetables and legumes, and for fruits, nuts, and seeds, we now have quite good evidence that the pr projected climate change will have significant impact on the ability of the food system to deliver foods in many parts of the world. And you can see, of course, uh, in that graph on the left, which shows the distribution of the impacts, uh, that many parts of the world, like Africa and Asia, with large populations, are really going to struggle uh, to produce foods, uh, sufficient foods, in the future. Now, at the same time, uh, whilst the environment is having an effect on the food system, the food system also has an absolutely enormous impact on the environment. And there's that picture of the food system that I showed you earlier. And at each stage, there are environmental impacts, whether it's methane emissions or carbon dioxide emissions, or whether it's the it, uh, impacts on the quality of the soil, or whether it's impact on, on, on other variables of interest. Uh, there are significant impacts of the food system on the environment. And we tend to think of these under four different uh, uh, major impacts. Number one, in the top left-hand corner there, it's environmental, uh, the, 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 the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, uh, which is, uh, you know, and the food system uh, contributes to somewhere around 30% of, of global greenhouse gas emissions come from the food system. 
On the right there, we have the use of water by the food system. And in some parts of the world, and you know, India is a good example, up to 90% of water that is withdrawn from rivers and reservoirs is used for agriculture. In the bottom left-hand corner there, we have the impact of, 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 of industrialized agriculture on soil quality. And you will know that it's really important to look after soils so that they can grow uh, crops uh, well. And then in the bottom right hand corner, we have the impact of the food system on biodiversity loss, whether it's due to rainforest cut down or other impacts of the farming system. So you can see that the, the food system that we have has really tremendous impacts on the environment already, which we need to be much more uh, uh, aware of and we need to reduce as much as possible. Um, now, there are opportunities all the way along the supply chain, all the way from the input, the production, the post-harvest storage, the processing, distribution, marketing and consumption, all the way along um, the, uh, uh, the, this food supply chain for us to identify solutions and opportunities uh, which will reduce the impact of the food system on the environment and make the food system more resilient. And when you're thinking about a food strategy for a city, you really need to think about all of these steps and think all the way along the food system, uh, uh, how you can ensure that the quality of the food coming into the city is good, that the quantity of the food coming into the system, in, 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 of the food coming into the city is sufficient, and that the impact of the city and the city's demand for food uh, on the environment uh, isn't, is, is not as catastrophic as it currently is. So really recognizing the two directional, the bi-directional role of the food system and the interlinks with the environment. And finally, I just want to say, this is really what I'm getting to. Uh, and this is the really thing that we must consider much more. When we think about food, we often think about, well, food and, and its link to health. But we must recognize that that food and those diets come from a food system uh, all the way from the farm, all the way to the bin, as I've mentioned already, and all of the things, the structures that support that food system. Uh, and then, of course, that the food system, you know, is, de is dependent upon, upon a, an environment that will enable the food to be grown. Uh, but the food system also has an unbelievable impact on the environment. So by linking up these sectors, you recognize the bigger questions. And it's only by linking up these, these, big, the, these, um, these, these sectors that you recognize the broader impacts of the food systems, both on our health and the environment. And also you recognize the impact of the environment on the food systems and our health. You can plan for the future. You can design a food strategy for a city that is future focused, not just dealing with today's problems, but has the ability to think into the future. You can build resilience within your food strategy so that if you know what's coming, you can build resilience into it. And ultimately, of course, what we're all care, what we all care about is protecting the people, our people, the people we work with, the people we live with, our families, our communities, um, but also the planet on which we live, because we cannot carry on using the planet in the way we do, um, because we, uh, uh, it's just not sustainable. So I hope I've given you some things to think about, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the contributions of the other speakers, and please do uh, come back to me with any questions, either in the chat box or in the Q&A later. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alan. That was a, a very compelling introduction to the topic. Absolutely. Um, yeah, a really great place to start. Um, and I'm going to introduce our next speaker now. So we have Ms. Balance Fala joining us from Itikwini Municipality in Durban. Uh, and Balance is, uh, Balance is a qualified aquaculture specialist and her work is focused on developing and improving research methods to support agriculture practices, aquaculture, sorry, practices educating communities on rearing and husbandry techniques of edible fish and providing guidance on issues related to the sustainability of this practice. And she's also been involved in providing technical assistance and expertise to community gardens to help ensure their sustainability. Now I'm going to um, share uh, Balance's side slides for her. So allow me to share my screen. 
Great. Okay, I'm ready when you are, Balance. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Balance from Durban, South Africa, and I'll be talking about how we help our farmers to become sustainable, and I hope other cities are able to learn from us. We'll move to the next slide, please. Uh, next slide, Florence. Do you, you can't see the next slide. I've just brought it up there. Okay, thank you. So just to give a brief introduction, the Itukunya municipality covers an area of about 2,555 square kilometers, and it's a home to plus 3.7 million people. And the municipality serves 100 wards, with 68% of which are peri urban or rural and um, his historically underdeveloped. So my presentation outline will include how we assist the set of projects and how we develop community gardens, household gardens, as well as our value chain development. Yes, thank you. Can move to the next slide. So despite um, the high economic growth, there's still a persistent food insecurity that remains a pressing problem. So as the Agroecology Unit, we aim to ensure food security and alleviate poverty. And we do that through promoting and supporting urban agricultural development, and we enhance the development, implementation, and, ad and adoption of sustainable ecosystem-based system. And that include encouraging home gardening, household gardening, community gardens, as well as the aquaculture programs. Is this the correct slide, Balance? Yes, thank you. So um, promoting the sub, uh, and supporting the household, household gardening, we do that because through the household gardening, we know that the household can relieve food insecurity. So we support them in form of garden tools or garden kits, and we provide training for them. So currently we are assisting 1,100 house, uh, vulnerable households. Uh, the selection criteria was we select 10 households from um, the 110 uh, wards within the municipality. So we do that every year and we support them throughout with seeds and seedlings and garden tools and implements. So in that way, while they're supplementing their food baskets, they're also able to make income from selling their produce. Next slide, please. So we've got, um, I'll say th three main points that we cover. So our support services include seedling supply, seed supply, mechanization in terms of track, uh, tractor transport, where we plow for our farmers. We provide infrastructure as well in terms of fencing. We provide storage containers. We provide irrigation systems and the tanks. And we also encourage um, we also encourage harvesting of gray water, you know, uh, water from the rain. And we also construct the ponds for them, which are very extensive and are easily manageable, and extension services as well as skills development. And in terms of research and development, we work in collaboration with various institutions where we test new crops through tissue culture and farm research and development as well as value chain enterprise. And marketing, we work in collaboration with other departments where we help our farmers and link, and link them to market. And hopefully we'll be able to develop a brand that other cities or other municipalities within the country or even worldwide can be able to refer to the Etikrini municipality. Next slide, please. Okay, so as mentioned, we are currently supporting plus 500 community gardens that form cooperatives. And our primary target for support are those that are vulnerable and where most impact can be made with limited resources. And those can be schools, clinics, orphanages, vulnerable households, as well as cooperatives. And we also have 14 community aquaculture ponds that we supply with fish fingerlings as well as feed, and we provide technical assistance throughout. So as Ed mentioned, we plow, we plow for our farmers, we provide guidance throughout the running of their projects. And once 
that so we do we provide them with uh, technical assistance throughout the running of their project and whilst they do that they're also able to mentor other startup projects that are coming in in that way we are able to ensure sustainability and as they're reaching market and as they're able to function on their own financial basis other startup projects are able to learn from the existing ones so our support uh, services infrastructure also include roadworks, the storage containers where they're able to store the seed seedlings and tools that we provide for them, such as holes, rakes, and spades, and the irrigation system from the tanks where they can also um, harvest the gray water. So also strengthen food systems through collaboration with what we have as well, what we do is we identify the youth that are able to run the nurseries. And with those, we connect our farmers to the existing nurseries and provide support to farmers to form farmers associations. So if there's anybody that um, is unable to grow seeds on their own, they are able to buy seedlings from the nurseries that we are also developing. And we also connect farmers to poverty programs that are within the municipality. So within the municipality, we also have the community participation. We also have the agribusiness department, which have the soup kitchen program. So our farmers are also able to sell their produce to the soup kitchens. And that way they're able to make income and they alleviate poverty. And it creates employment as well. And the agribusiness department connect our farmers to commercial and also um, they're able to sell to other provinces as well in training as well. And we implement the, the implementation of food safety standards through the through other entities, through other NGOs, so work oh, in collaboration. <laughs> the picture that you see on site there, we also have farmers information days where there's like various people sharing um, knowledge, so knowledge transfer where they share their challenges and other people are able to learn from each other through through observations and also through challenges that are shared among communities and that are shared among the different stakeholders that we get involved with. So recently had Farmers Information Day regarding the potatoes that we grew. So this potato has like five generations. At the moment we have a set, I think it's shown on my first slide, we have a set the first generation and we continue to teach the farmers how to grow the potatoes and also to leave others one side to make the other seed that will form the second generation up to the fifth generation. And that is how we're able to ensure sustainability because as, as much as they are growing the produce, they're learning in the process and they're also able to produce their own seeds and that way they carry on and yeah, other people learn from them as well. Next slide, please. So through value chain uh, development, we are also able to ensure um, we are we are also able to ensure sustainability from import to farm to processing to distribution, retail, and all the way through to consumer. So from the input, we will be the ones starting up the project, and we work together with other departments with the agro processing as well, and then the distribution. So we know that. We can be able to do one thing, but if we work together with other people, then obviously we are able to build relationships and our farmers are, are able to be connected uh, from one department to the other until they're able to stand on their own, until they're able to function their own, on their own financial basis, and they're also able to secure market for themselves. So that is how we encourage the value chain um, development. Yes, so we've got the Durban Fresh, Fresh Produce Market. That is our first go-to market when our farmers have reached, when our farmers have produce that have reached market size, we normally um, connect them to the Durban Fresh, Fresh Produce Market with these various crops, various commodities that are sold. And others have like um, the soup kitchen program, you can see on the, my right, probably your left, where 
the soup kitchen program would buy any produce that is in season and supply to the soup kitchens. So our farmers are still able to make an income from the produce that they are making. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you. Next slide. So um, our future plans including, include the, include involving other commodities such as poultry, grain, beef, and piggery, as well as expanding on our aquaculture. Last slide. So I just want to conclude with a quote from Nelson Mandela that says, we do not want freedom without bread, nor do we want bread without freedom. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. That was um, really, really interesting. I've got so many questions um, and a lovely quote to end on, really inspiring. Um, so on to our next speaker. Next, I invite colleagues from the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India and the Eat Right India campaign to talk about their initiatives around sustainable food systems. And once again, I will be sharing slides on their behalf. Thank you, Florence. Meanwhile, you share the slides. I'll introduce. Hi, I'm uh, Hena, and we're presenting Food Safety and Standards Authority of India for uh, you know sharing information on the sustainable approach under Eat Right India movement. Are we ready, Florence? We are. Fantastic. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Perfect. Um, so. The Eat Right India movement is a holistic, it's a holistic approach towards ensuring sustainable food systems in, in the country. And today we'll be discussing about the key initiatives that promote sustainability, promotes you know, prevention of uh, deterioration in environment, uh, to strengthen economy through its systems, and also build in resilience. But before I start with these initiatives and introduce what India is doing, it's really important that we understand what is the key problem that we are facing in the food supply chain? Next slide, please. So as you can see on your screens, the latest data of UNEP uh, clearly depicts that nearly 50 kg per capita per year of food is being wasted in the country. Also an internal surveillance data identified one of the issues that we do not talk much about is the used cooking oil. The data indicated that almost 105 million liters of oil is discarded by the food businesses in the country. Then another report by UNEP indicated that 9.46 million tons of plastic is being wasted in the country. And this out of which 43% is the single use plastic. This plastic is coming out of the food supply chain. So these are the key problems that we need to focus on. Next slide, please. Solution, as we all are aware, the sustainable food systems are the only solutions to such problems that we all need to adopt. And this sustainability issue cannot be implemented at one single point. We need to have sustainable solutions implemented at each step of food process cycle, that is from farm to full. Sorry. Uh, Eat Right India is a unique movement by, uh, you know, F, uh, uh, by government of India, which is a judicious mix, a mix of regulatory capacity building, collaborative and empowerment approaches, which helps in building such sustainable food solutions. Next slide, please. Uh, Florence, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So Eat Right India have three key pillars of Eat, which promotes safety, health, and sustainability is one of the important pillars of Eat Right India. While we promote eat local, eat seasonal, there are multiple projects which are focusing on prevention of food loss at the primary production level. There's also an you know, essential need to have programs which can be implemented at the food production till the end, you know, which is the waste disposal. Next slide. So the very first problem that I spoke about was the food waste, which was generated through the restaurants, households, as well as at retail level. To combat that and to you know, take care of that problem, we started with an initiative called Safe Food, Share Food Initiative. This initiative focuses on prevention of food waste by promoting surplus food donation at large, especially with the food businesses. 
and to you know to tackle this problem we created a holistic model of uh, you know a alliance which is ifsa indian food sharing alliance the surplus food recovery organizations are key players in collection and distribution of surplus food which can prevent food waste but you know prior to this initiatives most of these organizations were working in their own silos this initiative gave them a platform to join hands together and increase their outreach currently we have 82 plus such organizations present in 100 plus cities across india apart from forming this alliance and scaling up their outreach it's really important to provide technology solution to ifsa so to provide a technology platform fssai is very soon coming up with a ivr helpline a single food donation helpline number for the country where the donor can call and connect with the active uh, surplus food uh, distribution recovery organization in their areas apart you know along with this it is also important to have you know to build a confidence of the food business and the donors so regulatory approach was also taken in fssai's regulations for distribution recovery and distribution of surplus food ensures not only that the food is safe and hygienic for the beneficiary who's going to get the food but also encourages the food donors to donate food in a systematic manner there is a share food website which has been developed which is a knowledge hub on information regarding prevention of food waste you can get all the information about which food recovery organization is available in your city you can contact them directly from the safe food share food website apart from this all the eat right india initiatives all the cluster and various other initiatives implemented by uh, fssa under eat right india movement uh various awareness activities are taken up for uh, you know promotion of uh, surplus food donation and prevention of food waste next slide please uh we also attempted something really creative when it uh, came down to a donation of surplus food uh and campaigns played a key role in that so three campaigns that we introduced under this initiative was a small gesture a big difference which focused on uh, you know uh, the celebratory events and the social gatherings which is a common uh, phenomena in country of ours where uh, we have food donations and distributions on almost every possible occasions so over there we uh, you know on your right side of the screen you can see there's a brochure that we developed which were given to the wedding planners to the caterers that whenever somebody comes and books for a party this brochure can be given and beforehand they can commit to donate surplus food and this in turn prevents food to, uh, waste another interesting campaign that we launched was street food vendor has a heart where the street food vendors came forward and donated every 10th meal that was sold so this was launched in one of our national street food festivals in 2018 and this has been taken as a kick off for food donation campaigns in any city This campaign also gave an encouragement to other food businesses like restaurants and hotels who also came up and said that I have a heart and restaurants and hotels also pledged to donate 100 packs of food or needy every month now the concept behind this uh, campaign was that if every restaurant if we have 30 restaurant in a area and each restaurant donates 100 meals every you know a single day a month for 30 days one of our hunger spots will have regular meals for 100 people next slide please the second initiative one of the key problems that we identified in the food supply chain which was the used cooking oil which was a problem not only uh, to the environment but also to the health of the people if uh, the uh, the oil is over fried uh this initiative not only helped in uh, you know the environment friendly disposal but also created multiple opportunities for the community so apart you know there's a three tier approach that we uh, adopted for um, handling the used cooking oil issue that we identified the foremost was educating the food businesses and the consumers who were the key stakeholders about the harmful effects of over frying of oil then the next step was to have enforcement have regulations in place to ensure that oil used cooking oil is not uh, you know oil is not fried beyond 25% total polar compound level so now in india you know uh, the tpc is monitored for the oil which is used by food businesses for frying 
the food businesses which were having the capacity of using more than 50 liters of edible oil for frying per day are now supposed to maintain the record of used cooking oil generated and how it is being discarded also. Third was we are talking about the environment friendly sustainable model for managing the used cooking oil. It was really important to have the ecosystem for disposal. So taking the opportunity of uh, FSSAI along with Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas uh, created an ecosystem of biodiesel manufacturers. So now the used cooking oils from the food businesses is being collected and being uh, you know, used for uh, converting into biodiesel. This not only helps in preventing health, it also ensures environmental friendly disposal of oil and also generates employment opportunities for a su substantial number of people. Next slide, please. The third approach is prevention of plastic and water pollution, especially from the, uh, you know, emerging from the food supply chain. The fourth year approach to handle this problem was to encourage food businesses to become responsible towards the issue, encourage them to commit to manage their plastic waste, reduce their plastic footprint, and also explore alternatives for single use plastic that they've been using. Apart from that to manage the problem of water which is being utilized various methods to conserve water needs to be implemented and also reduction of chemical waste which is being uh, added into the water so food businesses many food businesses in the country have committed uh, for the cause they have signed a pledge to manage their plastic and water waste there are also multiple awareness campaigns the eat right india campaigns always focus on sensitization of the sustainability issues and challenges so plastic and water waste is also another area where eat right india initiatives focus on sensitizing about the harmful effects of plastic the campaigns on reduction of use of plastic then also suggesting the sustainable alternatives uh, promoting safe and sustainable packaging is another key approach by the country to prevent plastic and water pollution. The FBOs and citizens are being encouraged to reduce or stop the use of plastic, especially the single use of plastic in coming years. Now, very interesting, uh, you know, uh, campaign that we started, uh, started was around Eat Right Jhola. Jhola is nothing but a bag that you can carry. So FSSAI introduced the Eat Right Jola. You can see a few designs on the right side of the screens. The food businesses, especially the retail organizations, were uh, encouraged to keep these Jolas in their uh, you know, premises, to give them to the customers, and also, if possible, develop a facility to take them back and wash them, clean them, and reuse them while giving uh, food products to the customers. Uh, there is also a need for a collaboration with other government programs to approve, uh, you know, to achieve our aim of reducing plastic and water pollution. So there are two leading campaigns which we are part of, which is Swachhta Hi Save Up campaign of Government of India, which focuses on overall cleanliness and reduction of plastic waste, and Jal Shakti Abhiyan, which focuses on, uh, you know, uh, water preservation and uh, cleaning of water. So FSSAI is, uh, you know, uh, collaborating with these programs to ensure that plastic and water uh, pollution can be combated. Apart from that, all these initiatives are the base of other Eat Right India initiatives. There are various cluster initiatives, are, you know, implemented in the community, be it hubs, be it campuses, which are implemented in, you know, hospitals, different offices, etc. There is a Bhog initiative which focuses on uh, food and tem uh, temple. We have street food initiative where we street food hubs are being, uh, you know, converted into an eat right hub, where all these sustainability initiatives also plays a key role. That's all from my side. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was um, just a great array of really, really practical interventions. I really loved the, the stuff around the campaigns. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to introduce our last speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Christina Sosan, who is an officer at the Milan Food Policy Office. She joined the office uh, of the municipality of uh, Milan in 2019, where she's in charge of communication and promotion activities 
and she also supports the implementation of projects. She's an expert on water and food issues and has worked for several years in the field of awareness raising and communication within environmental organizations and fair trade organizations. And she holds a degree in sociology and a master's degree in integrated water services management. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, thank you. I try to share my screen. Let me know if you see it. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for uh, all the intervention that have been done before. Uh, it was very, very helpful. And my presentation will be uh, from the side of a public administration and for, from the city of Milan. Thanks for the first one that uh, from the London School of Hygiene that gave the idea of the complexity of a food system and how uh, important it is to try to act in all the several aspects in order to have uh, a positive effect and impact on the food system in order to reduce uh, the impact on climate and also on the territory and to provide healthy and, and sustainable food. Uh, thanks also to the presentation of, uh, um, of Durban uh, that mentioned the uh, farm to fork um, strategy uh, that is actually the EU strategy uh, that is uh, that the, the European Union uh, is trying to uh, enforce in order to uh, promote the sustainability of the food system. Uh, Milan has a, a long tradition, uh, I should say, a long because it's uh, since 2015 that we are working on food policy and on uh, the idea that um, the food system uh, should be treated in a transversal and cross-cutting uh, way. Uh, that's why it's very important to create a food policy, at least at urban level, in order to touch uh, many uh, of the parts that are related to the food system. Um, today, I will try to focus on the public procurement and on the actions that we as municipality did uh, and, are, and we are doing um, together with our public uh, agency uh, for, 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 for school canteen. Uh, we have a long tradition on public meals and public school uh, because as you've seen, it's more than 120 years that Milan uh, is having uh, public school and also public meals for school in order to uh, um, provide meals for children and to facilitate their attendance to school and provide them with at least uh, one meal per day. So it was like a long and important tradition uh, for us. Uh, nowadays, we, we provide 85,000 meals uh, per day. Uh, so you can see how how much um, public uh, means we deliver uh, with our um, public agency that is called Milano Ristorazione. And you can see from the map, 26 cooking center within the city and many others are small cooking center within the school. Uh, and it's very important to have these public, these public uh, kitchens because we prepare the food that goes all around uh, the schools. Uh, another important actions that we are doing uh, together with this uh, public uh, agency is to try to work on stop uh, food waste. Uh, how we have been able to deliver uh, more than uh, 50,000 uh, doggy bags at school in order that children can bring bread and fruit that don't consume uh, during the meal and take them at home or the desserts, depending on what we are offering during that day. And we saw that actually this action uh, is, is helping us in reducing food waste at school and enable us to talk with them and with the families uh, on the issue of food waste. Uh, here from this slide, you can see also another action that we do with the school canteens. Uh, the, this uh, Milano Ristorazione is also related and connected to uh, some NGOs in the city. And we uh, try to collect uh, food that uh, is not consumed directly from the canteens uh, to, the, to the poor and to this organization that redistributes food among uh, beneficiaries and people in need. Um, another very important program that we did in order to stop food waste, but also to deliver healthy food and to educate children to, uh, to food was the middle morning break with fruit. 
So we try to stop and to avoid uh, the, the, the families to give um, children uh, like um, snacks or kind of junk food for the middle break. And we introduced the uh, fruit uh, to all the schools uh, that want to join this program uh, in order to uh, promote healthy diet. And also because we saw that fruit was a, one of the, 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 the product that was uh, wasted at the end of the, at the, at the end of the meal. So we, we decided to stop the supply of food at the end of the meal and insert this fruit uh, in the middle morning. Uh, in order to to do to to have um, uh, two results and two impacts. Now coming to the public procurement action, we from this slide you you can see uh, a part of Milan that is a peri-urban area where we uh, decided to um, to start a pilot project, uh, try to focus on the supply and the promotion of uh, 19 uh, short supply chain uh, products. Uh, so we are doing uh, at the moment uh, some pilots uh, with uh, some specific products uh, such as rice, but also milk, dairy products uh, and other products that can be produced locally and then introduced within the public procurement at school. Uh, that was uh, the results also of one pilot project that we did with rice that was very successful. So now the school canteen are delivering the rice that is produced uh, uh, very close to Milan. So um, that, that was a, a very important step in order to promote local production and to reduce our impact, our footprint, uh, our food footprint uh, at local level. Uh, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy job, uh, we must admit. Uh, it's, it's an ongoing process in order to meet the requirements that the law is, is, is requesting to the public uh, school canteen agency uh, in order to meet all the uh, you know, the needs that the, the children have, like diets uh, or religious needs, because our public uh, um, uh, agency uh, delivers like the, the same menus, two, two menus, one for summer and uh, spring and one for winter and, uh, and autumn, and uh, with the specific issues for children that have problems in diets and uh, for religious needs, like all the children, we have quite a lot of you know, uh, religious um, uh, ethnic within schools. So uh, there is the possibilities for parents to ask for separate uh, diets. So we are delivering all of that. Uh, so the introduction of local products is very important for us and it helps us in the, um, uh, in the promotion of healthy food, but also reduction of impact. Uh, we participated also two years ago, uh, we started the collaboration with World Resource Institute uh, within this program that is called Cool Food Pledge. Uh, and we are trying, we try to measure how much our changes in the menus at school are effectively impacted the reduction of um, the impact on, on, uh, on climate. And it, we were very, very surprised by the results because in five years since uh, from 2015 up to 2020, we've been able to reduce by the 20% our impact um, by changing the, the menus. You can see, I, I hope you can see here uh, the changes that we did. So we tried to cut red meat, uh, beef uh, and uh, pork. We introduced more dairy products, but also actually we, we cut them, but also we introduced uh, different uh, uh, receipts. Uh, we introduce uh, more poultry, more uh, eggs, and we introduce more legumes, nuts, fruits, and vegetables. So we try to change the diets uh, also according to what the uh, foundation and other uh, Eat Lancet, uh, um, the Eat Lancet Commission suggested. And in five years, uh, we, have, we educated we, and we also introduced uh, different recipes, different colors, different uh, type of um, uh, menus that uh, uh, helped us in reducing our, our uh, impacts on, uh, on the system, on the food system and on the climate. Uh, and we will work on that. We, still, we, could, we, we, we will continue to work on that. Uh, we were actually one of the best cities uh, in Europe that participated to this program. You can see here the reduction of uh, GAG uh, equivalent emissions. 
and as I said, by the 20%. Uh, we also try to, to measure how these changes uh, are appreciated by children, because you can do all the, the changes that you want, but if children don't like the, <laughs> the plates, they just throw them away. So it's very important to measure how they like these uh, plates and how we can monitor the changes that we, uh, that we propose. That we propose. Uh, another important thing was the substitution and uh, uh, the introduction of uh, bioplastic and compostable, compostable materials and their reduction and actually the complete uh, cut of plastic uh, on the tables of children. Uh, unfortunately, the COVID um, um, imposed us the, the need to introduce again bottled water just for the classes that uh, eat within the class, not the one that you see here uh, all together. So some of them are still receiving plastic bottles um, because of monoportion, but many of the students are um, uh, taking water from tap, from public water and from the uh, water jug that has been uh, distributed uh, two years ago. And then you can, and that's the one that you can bring from home. So you can bring your um, jar from home and then you take from public water because also Milan have, have this important public water system and we ensure that public water is uh, available for all. Closing my intervention, you can see here the stakeholder engagement. A food policy in order to be effective should involve uh, many, many actors like citizens, but also all the public and private actors that can help us in the definition and in the uh, planning of actions within the food system, the food system that professor from the school, from the London School of Hygiene talked before, uh, in order to ensure that all the priorities that you uh, plan are uh, uh, fulfilled. Uh, last, uh, lastly, I want to talk about the uh, community, community of practice. So uh, they, the, the issue that uh, we involve the uh, stakeholders through community of practice in 2021 was was not very easy so we did some webinars as we are doing today uh, the one on healthy diets on short supply chain uh, a very important one on food aid unfortunately food aid became a very important issue after covid on circular economy and food waste uh, so that was all for me if you have a question i'm here thanks for your attention Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, really shows how public procurement links into so many different aspects of sustainability. Um, fantastic. So we've got just about five minutes for some questions. Um, if you do have a question, please do pop it in the chat box or if you um, don't want to use the chat box, you're very welcome to raise your hand and I will come to you. But I would like to invite someone who uh, the question in the box earlier. Dr. Halogian, would you like to ask your questions to your question to balance, please? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you so much for this fantastic webinar. A uh, lot of nice information. Uh, I'm just, uh, perhaps it's more a suggestion to balance that, you know, considering one health and all the importance of food safety and security in one health, uh, I, I think that food safety and, you know, health must be a separate entity in that value chain that she was talking about. I'd like to know her idea if they considering that and if they are doing some uh, some actions in that regard. You know, foodborne diseases are a big issue in Africa. Out of the 10 first uh, foodborne disease of whole world, nine of them, we have them in Africa. So in South Africa, 30% is an estimate of foodborne disease prevalence. So I just like to know if they are considering that uh, that factor, that entity in their food value chain. Thank you. Thank you. Balance, do we still have you with us? Yes. Thank you so much for that suggestion, Dr. Ali, and, and for your question. So um, to answer it, we are practicing organic farming, meaning we use everything organic, organic pest control, organic fertilizers and with regard to food safety we are practicing biosecurity as well as practicing hygiene so whenever people have to walk in and out of the tunnels the sanitizing of hands 
even before COVID. And there's washing of hands and anything that you have to do, wear gloves. And yeah, there's a lot of practices that uh, get involved. And before sending out fish, especially to the community, there's an inspection form where we inspect for parasites and anything that might just be, I mean, yeah, keeping in mind that there is foodborne disease, like you've mentioned. But yeah, thank you so much for your question and your suggestion. I hope that answers your question. Fantastic. Thank you, Balance. Um, I'm going to go to uh, my colleague Charlene, who is the engagement lead for the Food Cities 2022 project. So I hope that some of you um, have uh, have already met Charlene. Um, so Charlene, um, please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, so great to see such a large audience. So it's directed to all of the speakers actually, because here in Europe we're trying to encourage a shift towards a plant-based diet. And Professor Dangle already pointed out that um, the legumes are going to be, pulses are going to be the hardest hit crop. So um, the question was in relation to this transition for Christina, did you face any cultural barriers? And if you stopped using meat that was procured in Italy, did you start importing legumes? Um, Alan, your thoughts on that comment as well. And then um, to Hina, if you're still online, it's interesting to see that India is importing legumes. It's one of the largest importers, um, but there's also an increase in demand for, for meat. And so just thoughts on, is there any messaging around adhering to the traditional plant-based diet in India? So over to you all. Alan, do you want to start? It just might, might make, in the order of the speakers, it might make. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, I think it also, it relates to, so there's two things that are being, that need to be discussed, but they actually need to be discussed com together. So one of them is about mitigation. How do we reduce our impact? Uh, how do we cut out plastic? How do we, you know, reduce food waste? All of those sorts of things. But the other thing, which is going to be so important for cities, and I hope I, I, I made clear in my talk, is how do we ensure that in the future there will be sufficient food that is healthy to make healthy diets, you know, in countries around the world? And I think, you know, we heard today quite a lot, you know, uh, uh, about the, re the reducing the impacts, the food waste and those sorts of things. But I really would like to know, uh, maybe from Hina and Christina as well, uh, what plans there are for uh, for shaping the food system so that it is more resilient to the impacts of climate change in the future. Thank you so much. Uh, India is really working towards shaping its policies to make sure that uh, you know the environment, the entire mitigation of the climate chain can also be included. When we talk about food uh, waste, the area that we identified was surplus food, which was actually going into the dump and was again becoming a cause for increase in greenhouse gases and other uh, you know problems related. So this is one approach. There are, you know, these are intergovernmental, uh, uh, you know, approaches which are going on. There are different departments which are working on prevention of food loss also. So these policies are being implemented and gradually we are trying to create an ecosystem where they can be implemented on large scale as well. So I am sure that when uh, the entire Eat Right India policies, which are, uh, you know, we are very rigorously, we are implementing these policies in the country. So apart from health and safety, the sustainability is also the key issue which will be implemented and will, uh, you know, in future, near future, will actually take up the overall, uh, you know, issue. Hi. Fantastic. No answer. Yeah, sorry, Thank you. Christina, did you want to come in? Yeah, just a few words on the diets, on the changes of the diets. Yes, it was quite tricky because we we decided not to be very transparent uh, with families in the introduction of these new changes. We did it after when we saw that hmm, well, the pasta with the with the soya or legumes is good. Actually, okay, then we we said, oh yes. We, we, we cut off um, uh, meat, so it's okay, your children like it, and actually, it, uh, you know, uh, the result is, is, very, is, very, um, is very good. So we try to find out some tricks in order to change his diets and in order to convince and to prepare families and children to appreciate these changes. It's not, it's not easy, and it's something that comes with the... Uh, uh, with the work with a lot of experts that come to the, to the definition of the menus 
uh, from the municipality because it's part of the company and from the nutritionists and from the experts and from the um, also healthy department that participates to these meetings in order to check that the diet is, uh, is right for children. Uh, secondly, uh, Italy actually uh, is promoting the um, minimum environmental criteria for the public uh, uh, for the public canteens, uh, private and public. So you have to expect some environmental uh, and you have to also pr propose how to um, uh, improve your environmental, the environmental aspects of your uh, service uh, in terms of organic food, in terms of uh, zero kilometer or short supply chain, and also introducing, you can also introduce some uh, social criteria rather than um, such as the Third rate products. So you can put in your call for tenders when a public uh, company has to do the call for tenders because in Europe has to do that in order to select the producers or the, um, uh, the products. You do your call for tenders and you can ask for products that are produced locally. So you said legumes. Actually, legumes are produced in Italy. So for sure, uh, it depends, maybe not in the very uh, um, close area of Milan, but then you have some regions close to Milan that produce you know, those products. So you can select them rather than um, taking them from uh, other parts. Uh, that, that is not the case for the fair trade products because fair trade is based on, you know, try to support uh, people from India, Africa, or whatever, you probably know that. So it depends, it's a balance, it's a process, and we are very, uh, we know that it's not, it's not easy, but also it, uh, we have the luxury of having a public service provider that uh, um, allow us, of, you know, trying to, to mix and connect uh, all the, the needs that we want to, uh, to develop. Fantastic. Thank you, Christina. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to um, bring us to a close as we have uh, run over by a few minutes. Just in response to the question about the presentations, absolutely, they'll be shared in the follow up uh, email. Um, a massive thank you to our four brilliant speakers. Um, as ever, I am very inspired by um, all of the exciting things that are happening around the world. Um, next, uh, next webinar will be on the 4th of August, and we're starting to look at how to really craft a strategy to uh, be really place specific, so specific to your city's needs. Uh, and we're gonna begin with stakeholder engagement. So we have three fantastic state case studies uh, looking at um, citizen engagement, uh, engagement of local farmers and also of uh, food and nutrition professionals. So I will drop a link into the chat for you to register. And of course, we'll be uh, putting that link in my follow up email as well. So we hope to see many of you then. Um, and as ever, um, a pleasure to welcome you all today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thanks so much. <laughs>